All right, well, welcome everyone. Thank you for being here. Uh, today, we're very fortunate to be joined by Dr. Robert Labadee, who's the chairman of uh, our Department of Otolaryngology here at MUSC, and he'll be speaking to us about cochlear implants. Uh, Dr. Labadee is an NIH-funded surgeon scientist and an international expert on uh, cochlear implantation and uh, image-guided otologic surgery. Uh, before joining us at MUSC here, he spent 20 years at Vanderbilt, where he served as the Vice Chair of Research and the Robert Ossoff Director of Translational Research in Otolaryngology. He completed his undergraduate training at Notre Dame, went on to do an MD and a PhD at the MSDP at the University of Pittsburgh. He did his residency at UNC and then joined Vanderbilt on faculty. Um, and as I mentioned, he's an international expert on minimally, minimally invasive techniques for cochlear implant surgery and image guided otologic surgery. And we're very thankful to have him here speaking to us today. Um, so without further ado, please take it away, Dr. Labadee. All right. Thank you so much, Josh. So uh, Mallory asked me to talk on cochlear implants, and I thought we'd kind of go over some advanced topics for this group. Uh, these are my disclosures. Uh, my uh, grant is through the NIDCD, and uh, I'm a consultant for Spiral Therapeutics, which is a uh, company looking at biologics for uh, the uh, inner ear. I I'd like to start with this, which, uh, I, you know, anybody who uh, knows anything about cochlear implants knows that uh, Bill House was really one of the pioneers in the field. And Either one of these two books are available on uh, Amazon, and I would highly recommend uh, interested parties reading them. Uh, the first one is uh, Bill House's autobiography. It is a fascinating read. Uh, he uh, kind of lays it all out there. He talks about the challenges. He talks uh, a lot about things that uh, he wish would have gone a different way. Uh, and the other one is a uh, biography uh, that Mike Glasscock uh, worked on uh, with the author, uh, and it's it's a very interesting read. It's it's more kind of a story version, well, where, where Bill's is much more kind of a here were the challenges that I had, but both are really worth uh, reading. I love this slide because I think this is really where cochlear implants are now, uh, rather than where they started in the uh, 1970s. You know, people don't view these as a cochlear implant. They view it as their lifeline to be able to integrate into educational processes, especially for kids, and then for older uh, adults, really to participate in wider social settings, especially older adults who live alone. This is the lifeline to their kids, their community. And it's where we're really heading now that we need to be talking about not just getting people to have some speech understanding, but really how can we get people to uh, integrate back into normal communication? This is a, a slide that uh, I got from uh, uh, Blake Wilson, who uh, was one of the last award winners, uh, along with um, Ingeborg Hockmeyer and Graham Clark uh, for their advances in cochlear implants. Uh, everybody thought that the Nobel Prize was gonna go to them, uh, but the fact that Bill House had passed away stopped that opportunity because you have to be alive to get uh, the Nobel Prize. But nonetheless, uh, Blake uh, came and did a discovery lecture when I was at Vanderbilt, and uh, he I added a couple time points on this, uh, but early in the 1970s were really the first cochlear implants, and then you have a handful, and then it starts to pick up into the tens of thousands in the late 1990s, and then uh, just uh, into the 2000s, uh, about 100,000. And all this data, of course, is very hard to come by in lags. You can look at the NIDCD website and uh, they'll tell you X number, but it's uh, from three years ago. I think the current figure is from 2019. And that figure is in the mid 700,000 that have been done worldwide. What's interesting to contrast this with is where we are in terms of CNC word scores. and We've we've kind of stalled. We started off uh, at 50% in the 1990s, really feeling we had made a huge difference. We've we've reached up to the low to mid 60th percentile, and uh, that's about where we are. Uh, and if you would think of any patient that you would see who comes into uh, your otologic clinic and mid 60th percentile for word scores, 
you think something's wrong, yet we consider that a success with cochlear implants. So why aren't we there yet? Well, there's a whole bunch of reasons, and a lot of it is variability of the individual patient. But these are the big ones that I think about, uh, and it's the top three. The first really is the bottom-up uh, problem, which means that we are not matching the stimulation with what the nerve is expecting. And a lot of that, I think, comes down to not getting the electrode array where it belongs. A lot of that is that the electrode array is not the proper size for most people. Uh, the other issue is the top-down issue, and uh, I won't speak much on this as there are other experts on the field, including Aaron Moberly, who's on uh, this uh, nerve lecture. And I will talk briefly about not providing optimal rehabilitation. And there are some low-hanging fruit that we as clinicians can do to potentially help our patients. I think another uh, big issue is realistic expectations. Uh, another one of our faculty members here at Medical University of South Carolina, Teddy McCracken, uh, has pioneered the use of the cochlear implant quality of life. I'll give a, a brief shout out to him and a pitch for that. And then uh, I'll kind of end with talking about my thoughts about the future of the field and uh, where, all, where we're headed. So uh, bottom up. I think everybody in on this conference call can appreciate this right ear, and you can see the facial recess nicely drilled. You can see the stapedial tendon, and you can see the round window overhang. And I'm not sure if that's a, a false round window membrane or the true round window membrane. My guess is the false membrane and that the overhang needs to be taken down. And then the membrane reflected inferiorly, which basically gives you this view. So you're looking into the cochlea and you get a general sense for how that basal turn is going. Uh, you can get in a little bit closer with an endoscope. And I have to credit Richard Cole, who was the uh, past chair at WashU in St. Louis, who was the first one to think to put an endoscope inside the cochlea, uh, allowing pretty cool images like this, where you can see the osseous spiral lamina and you can see the basal membrane, and you can get a sense for which way the basal turn is starting to turn. And then once you put a cochlear implant electrode in, you can see it make perchance that first turn, but that's about all you get. So it, it truly is kind of a blind insertion. And uh, I think that you know if we had better tools, we probably would be better at doing this. Th this still is my dream. Uh, the date on uh, this paper is 2011. I think we're getting very close to miniaturization of cameras and uh, light sources to be able to literally drive a cochlear implant uh, electrode array in. Uh, and, and I hope this is available sometime in the future because basically we're putting this thing into a, a black box. We, we have no idea uh, where it's going to end up. We don't know the orientation of the cochlea for an individual patient. Uh, but hopefully we do know some things uh, that can help us. These are really striking images that were provided by uh, the crew at uh, UT Southwestern. C. Gary Wright was a PhD histopathologist who worked with Peter Rowland for uh, many years before both of them have retired. And uh, Gary uh, would unroof cochleas to be able to get these beautiful views. So this is a view where the cap of this left cochlea has been removed and you can see the uh, osseous spiral lamina with the individual nerve fibers coming out and then on the lateral aspect uh, the basal membrane as it gets uh, uh, changes size from base to apex and in this area in the black brackets is essentially what you can see and, and there's not much else you can see so what we hope happens is that you align your uh, electrode array tangentially and that it smoothly follows the contour of the cochlea, but it can also bounce off of the medial wall and then hit the lateral wall. Or what I think is probably much more common is to have it bounce off the lateral wall, reflecting into and often through the osseous spiral lamina creating a translocation. 
And we don't know if this happens. We've done studies looking at the force that's required to sense this, and human beings are just at that level of perception. So I think depending on human force detection is not a good strategy to avoid this. These are the kind of things that are seen clinically. People don't often talk about, but they happen. Uh, this is a tip foldover. Uh, there's the image on an intraoperative CT scan on the left and a reconstruction on a right. And for pre-curved electrode arrays, this happens about 2% of the time. So if, if you're a big center doing 100 plus cochlear implants at a time, you're going to have uh, two to four to six of these every year. And it's very difficult to detect uh, without intraoperative CT scanner. You can use flat plates, uh, fluoroscopy, and if you align it just correctly, uh, that will help you detect this. Spread of excitation, which is uh, becoming more and more standard on the cochlear implant uh, testing portals, will also help to give you an alert that this may be happening. Uh, there's a higher incidence with uh, the cochlear 632 device, which has a tip fold over rate that's closer to 5%. Uh, so we really need to be uh, alert that this can happen, and it's not uh, a fact that you're not a good surgeon. It's a fact that uh, you're putting an electrode array blindly into the cochlea, and this can occur. More common, especially for pre-curved electrode arrays, is this, which is the translocation from scala tympani to scala vestibuli. The CT scan is shown on the right, and then the reconstruction is shown on the left. And this occurs relatively frequently with the pre-curved electrode arrays. Uh, the numbers have dropped a little bit. Uh, these uh, studies are a bit dated, uh, but I'm working on a review article for translocation, and the numbers are still in the mid to upper 20 percentile and sometimes into the 30th percent of having a translocation, especially for a pre-curved electrode array. And straight electrode arrays are not immune from this either. Uh, the deeper you put them in, the smaller the height of uh, the scala, and that can cause either the electrode array to push up on the vasomer membrane and or to grossly translocate. And the numbers are anywhere from 5 to 10% for straight electrode arrays. And I think that this is even more common. This is a pre-curved electrode array on the left, which is properly positioned. And then on the right side is where the manufacturer tells you it should be with the generic insertion marker shown just outside the shaded pink scala tympani. And if you follow that generic insertion for this patient, you're essentially taking a pre-curved electrode array that's designed to be perimedialar, and you're making it a lateral wall position in that mid region as you push it deeper in. And this occurs surprisingly frequently. When we anal analyzed uh, about 200 patients uh, from uh, the Vanderbilt data in 2017, this was occurring three fourths of the time. So when you, when you look at all this, I, I think there's you know no good way to say it other than you know we barely pass in terms of being able to put these electrode arrays in a proper position where they're going to give uh, a patient the uh, best benefit. And it's amazing that despite this, people do surprisingly well, which I think it relates a lot to uh, the neuroplasticity that we'll talk about in a little bit. Uh, but, the, but the biggest problem in my mind is that it's a one size fits none situation, uh, which is illustrated in this cartoon with the same size suit. And you uh, have a number of different body types trying to fit into that suit. I often use the analogy of shoe size and uh, a frequent question for medical students who come into the operating room is to ask them if all cochleas are about the same size. Uh, and most of them feel that they are about the same size. And then I ask them, uh, you know, what size shoe they buy and why they just, you know, don't buy a size 10 shoe, which is the medium size shoe that should fit everybody. And I think it gets the point across that uh, the body 
uh, the cochlea is just like any other part of your body, that there's a normal distribution of the size of uh, the cochlea. And this was really nicely illustrated in 1938. Let me repeat that, 1938. So we've known about this for a really long period of time. And this is a really interesting study that was done by Mary Hardy, who uh, was at Hopkins, and it was a, uh, a single authored study. And she painstakingly excised the organ of cordy and temporal bones and showed uh, that there are uh, differences. Uh, men's cochleas are a little bit bigger than, than female cochleas. Uh, there's no difference across uh, race. She did African-Americans and Caucasians. But there is this relatively normal distribution that centers uh, right about 32 millimeters. But there are some people who have much shorter cochleas and some people who have much longer cochleas. So it, I think it's really important for us to be aware of that before we go into the operating room, because that's one of the few things that we as surgeons can change about this operation is how deep do you put in, what trajectory uh, do you select? And to do this, there are a number, number of image processing uh, software uh, programs. This is one that uh, was developed at Vanderbilt University and uh, I continue to use at MUSC. I use this on all of my cochlear implants because I think it's that important. I think uh, going in without something like this, uh, you're just not prepared for the case. And there are two views that the software will get, give you. This is uh, a view uh, to show you uh, how deep you should put it in. And then this is the view that will show on this left ear the surgical trajectory that will align tangentially with the basal turn. This is an interactive uh, computer uh, graphic user interface, so you can rotate this in various ways to be able to see the anatomy, the facial nerve and the magenta, the corda tympani in green. Uh, you can see the ossicles and the turquoise, and then uh, the uh, promontory in the yellow. You can toggle all these things on and off, and it gives you a virtual view of what you're going to encounter in the operating room. We then provide textual information that will say, hey, this is, if you're going to do an extended round window on this one, you should be this far away from the facial nerve and the corda, and this is about how far you should be north-south in reference to the ossicles. Uh, we talk about the trajectory uh, with respect to the round window membrane. Uh, we talk about how the curl should be towards, in this place, towards the stapes foot plate, and then we specify what the insertion depth should be, and then if you're using the pullback technique, which is has been shown to more uh, tightly snug uh, the uh, paramedialer uh, to get a paramedialer positioning where it should be both with the depth of insertion uh, and then when you pull back to snug that. When uh, we compare this to uh, post-op CTs, and we're using intraoperative CTs, but you can use post-op CTs as many, uh, many facilities are using, you can see that you've achieved the plan. So the textual information, both from uh, temporal bone studies and then clinical studies uh, like you see here, show that you can achieve this, that we have the ability to implement uh, the plan. Then we also use this in terms of uh, post-operative assessment, especially for our um, uh, programming audiologists. Uh, so we're able to specify uh, where uh, the uh, electrode array ends up in the Scala Timpani. We also can see where the electrode arrays are with uh, relationship to the tonotopicity of uh, the neural endings in the medialis. And Based on this, you can do uh, frequency allocation tables that are different than those recommended by the manufacturer. You can also turn on and off electrodes uh, based on simple things like an electrode uh, is outside of the cochlea. Uh, it's, uh, we wrote a paper about that, and there's uh, a surprising number of electrodes that are left on when they're actually outside of, of the cochlea. Uh, that's really low hanging fruit that our audiology colleagues really need to know to be able to provide uh, better outcomes. And then when you have neighboring electrodes, they often can interfere with each other. 
I use the analogy that it's like two flashlights that are kind of next to each other and you have a cone of light that's shining on the medialis. And uh, this one is, is really nicely positioned. Uh, but if it was one of those where that mid uh, basal turn, it was pushed against the lateral wall, that might interfere with a neighbor that's very close to the medialis. And by turning that off, you may provide a crisper and a cleaner signal. We try to provide this information to the audiology uh, uh, staff uh, who are programming at initial activation. Uh, we are uh, piloting doing this all on site here at MUSC with technical support from the engineering crew at Vanderbilt University. And we've been relatively successful thus far, and our audiologists have uh, come to uh, expect this. When they don't see the PDF printout of this uh, for uh, one of their upcoming patients, uh, they they call one of us and say, I really need that because they become almost um, dependent on it, uh, which uh, may not be a great thing, but I think it shows the utility of this and how much it can uh, change outcomes. We're not the only group uh, to be doing this. There are some commercially approved uh, softwares that are out there. This is Medel's Odo Plan software, and they essentially do the same three things that I've just presented from our software. They do preoperative assessment and planning. Uh, this is based on uh, the so-called capital A measurement, which is from the round window to uh, through the uh, mid medulla region to the lateral wall. And this can be used to estimate the two turn cochlear duct length and then to select from among the various sizes that Medel offers the 24, 28 and 31 uh, millimeter length. Uh, this is how it looks on the iPad that they uh, uh, provide. You can see in the top left the rendering of the facial recess and similarly to our software you can rotate around there and uh, see what trajectory you feel would give you the best entry tangential to the basal turn. Uh, the electrode uh, selection software is in the middle panel there. And then the post-operative CT scan, if you get one, can be imported into the same software and it will show you where the electrode arrays are. We, and I, I think this is going to continue to become the new standard, that this is a definitive end point to the surgery. Uh, during my training at UNC Chapel Hill, we would uh, put the electrode array in and Rick Pillsbury would say, great job. Full insertion, super. And you really didn't know anything other than that because all you saw was the electrode array uh, sticking out of the cochleostomy that you had made. But this gives you tangible, objective, quantifiable uh, uh, evidence that it is in the cochlea. It tells you if it's in scald tympani or scald vestibuli, it tells you how far away it is from the medialis. And the electrode selection component uh, that uh, we use is a little bit different than Medel's, mostly because Medel only offers straight electrode arrays. And I, uh, before I talk about this, I really want to harp on the point that I think we should be calling these electrode arrays by their resting state shape. That means that the state that the electrode array is when it, it comes out of the box uh, without a stylet or without anything holding it, just if you lay it down on the surgical field, what shape is it? So the straight electrode arrays are intended to rest against the lateral wall, but they don't always end up on the lateral wall. So I think we need to refer the, to these as straight electrode arrays. And then the pre-curved electrode arrays are intended to curl around the medialis and end up in the perimedialar positioning, but they don't often end up in that position. So I think we should call those uh, pre-curved electrode arrays. And over the last five years, and even the last two to three years, there's increasing evidence that the proximity of the electrode arrays to the medialis is associated with better audiologic performance. And this is coming both from the data at Vanderbilt University Medical Center, uh, data from the Netherlands, and data from UNC Chapel Hill. Uh, the data that uh, came out of Vanderbilt uh, looked at uh, a large cohort of patients who had had post-op CT scans that were done in the operating room. And uh, uh, this was published uh, back in 2019. 
And you can see in this table that uh, if you have good placement of a pre-curved electrode array, you do surprisingly good in terms of your CNC word scores. And by good placement, we mean no translocation and it's close to the medialis. If you do poor placement of pre-curved, which would be translocation or far away from the medialis, uh, the outcomes are not so great. Uh, and for a straight electrode array, uh, a good placement is a deeper insertion and a poor placement is a more superficial uh, insertion. What's really interesting about uh, this data is if you then multiply the outcome by the expected outcome, uh, I'm sorry, multiply the percentage of word scores by uh, how often it occurs. So we in this series had 35% translocation in pre-curved and 10% translocation in straight electrode arrays. You get about the same thing. So this is masked by the translocation effect. And this really shows you that we need to be better at defining where the electrode array is to be able to predict what the outcome should be. And if you just loop everything together, lump everything together, it turns out that you get about this 64 to 65% word scores. Actually, in, in this data set, the straight looks a little bit better when you don't account for the positioning. And then this was a matched cohort comparison study, uh, which showed uh, word scores that were a little bit worse overall, but again, that there was a improvement or a differential when you had the uh, pre-curved in the right position, the correct position, in this case, 56% uh, word scores versus, I believe that's a 43% telling me I should have made that slide quite a bit bigger, uh, but uh, still a statistically different uh, word score based just on the electro characteristics. Then uh, the group at, at Chapel Hill, they weren't intending to look at this, and uh, they uh, were looking at electrocochleography and angular insertion depth and cochlear implant uh, perception scores. But if you look at their uh, table, uh, they have mostly straight electrode arrays being a heavy Medel center, but their uh, cochlear and their AB pre-curved electrode arrays have median word scores, which are substantially better than the straight uh, electrode arrays. Uh, so on the uh, cochlear advance, uh, you know, on average, about 75% and the AB uh, mid-scala about the same. I'm pretty convinced that these bottom two numbers on the cochlear advance were probably translocations. And then if you look at the um, medels as you lump those together, uh, not as good in terms of what the CNC word scores are. And then uh, the most recent work came out in the Netherlands, uh, and this was published in 2021. Uh, and this uh, uh, very well-respected group did a, a deep dive into uh, both AB, it's predominantly AB devices, but there were also some cochlear devices. And uh, their conclusion was that uh, with a, a pre-curved electrode array, there was a significantly higher speech perception outcome Interestingly, they found that it was independent of scalar location. So uh, uh, spool scala vestibuli insertion and or translocation did not portend a poorer outcome uh, for this group. And they hypothesize, as others have, that it's really getting the electrical charge in close proximity to the medialis uh, and to limit the channel interaction between those electrode arrays that allows the better audiological outcomes. So top down, I, I will not pretend to be an expert on this, especially with Aaron on the call, but I will say that I don't think uh, we're doing enough in, in even uh, you know, planting a seed in our patients' minds when they are in our clinics. And I think uh, a simple thing to do is just to mention audiobooks to them. Uh, most senior citizens understand what audiobooks are. With Audible being so popular, uh, they listen to books on tape regularly. If, uh, well, it's really books on a smartphone. Uh, and, and if you couple that with visually looking at the book while you are listening to it, that 
audiovisual reinforcement uh, has been shown by many groups to very effectively rehabilitate our patients. Uh, there's also some really fantastic stuff coming down the pike with uh, interactive uh, computer games that help to uh, train our patients to incorporating uh, visual components and that that audio visual is synergistic in terms of uh, rehabilitation. And then uh, realistic outcomes, uh, really what Teddy uh, McCracken has done is, is really remarkable. He put together this uh, humorous slide for his presentation at the ACIA meeting with uh, one of our audiologists who was expecting and, and had her uh, child recently uh, playing off of that uh, uh, pretty popular book, What to Expect When You're Expecting. But we really need to let patients know what to expect. Uh, they're nervous about this. They know what a hearing aid can do for them. They don't know what a cochlear implant can do uh, for them. And uh, Teddy, over many years of work uh, validating uh, a questionnaire with so many participating centers across the United States, for which he is so thankful, uh, was able to define uh, five different domains. And each domain, you can do a essentially a normal distribution of where you think people were large populations end up. So in the communication domain, uh, step one is unable to have a conversation in any listening environment. And that happens in uh, less than 1% of cochlear implant recipients, but it does happen. Uh, step two is can sometimes have a conversation in quiet environments, need people to repeat themselves, usually unable to have a conversation in noisy environments. And that happens in about 13% of patients who get uh, cochlear implants. The largest piece of the pie is stage three, 64%. Sometimes able to have a conversation, a small group and quiet, has great difficulty understanding in noisy environments. And letting our, our patients know that this is what they are likely going to experience, I think is it goes a world, uh, setting those expectations helps the audiologists, helps us, helps everybody. There are patients who do even better than that. Stage four, able to have a conversation in small groups and quiet, and sometimes have a conversation in noisy environment. And then there's also some superstar performers who are able to have a conversation in virtually all listening environments with essentially no uh, lip reading. And again, it, it's kind of a normal distribution, and uh, uh, we can at least tell patients, hey, you know, there's a more, it's more likely that you're gonna end up in stage three than stage four, stage two, but you might end up in, in stage one or five. And these same domains uh, can be found uh, in uh, uh, entertainment, listening effort, uh, and I'm blanking on the other two, but really fascinating work uh, that uh, Teddy continues, got the Mosier Award from the Trilogic Society this year uh, for this work. And then uh, maybe finishing up, we just have a couple more minutes. Uh, before entertaining questions, just a couple thoughts about the future of the field and uh, where things uh, may be heading. ECOG, I see that there's an upcoming talk by uh, Oliver Adunka, uh, so I, I won't uh, go into this too uh, much in depth, but the idea is that if you have some residual hearing, you can play uh, a tone uh, while you're putting the cochlear implant electrode array in and you can use the cochlear implant electrode to pick up what the response is and that response may be predictive of what the outcome may be especially in terms of hearing preservation and uh, oliver has uh, 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 submitted and got accepted a, a u grant from the nidcd uh, which is a large uh, multi-center trial to see what the outcomes will be with this with uh, uh, the surgeons uh, uh, blinded to what the ECOG signal is and whether this is going to be useful moving ahead. Uh, I, I think it holds uh, great uh, promise. Uh, the uh, AB uh, device has been out for a, a couple years. The cochlear device is working its way uh, through uh, uh, product launch. Some of the centers have it, some other centers uh, do not have it yet. And when you record these ECOGs, for those of you who have seen it, it gives you uh, kind of an auditory response as to whether you're uh, presumably causing uh, trauma to uh, the inner ear. So it'd be very interesting to see if this machine can be used to 
uh, potentially be less traumatic and preserve residual hearing, which does result in improved outcomes. Uh, drug delivery has been hypothesized for two decades, and uh, we're finally at the point that it's happening uh, for a number of the companies. Uh, clinicaltrials.gov is uh, uh, a fascinating place to uh, dig into data to see what companies are up to, because any clinical trial that uh, it can't that will be submitted for publication within the United States has to be listed, and uh, it's it's sometimes you have to sort through a bunch of different things, but you can kind of find out what the different companies are uh, doing. Uh, they might not often be forthcoming about what they're doing, but they have to declare it to the federal government. So uh, a good place to watch trends. Uh, this this is the trial that's going on uh, now with Cochlear. Uh, of course, with their uh, 632 device, totally implantable cochlear implants. Boy, you know that was that was the uh, the holy grail that people wanted to see happen uh, many many years ago. And this is uh, a paper from 2008 uh, from the Australian experience. And uh, the biggest problem uh, with this was that uh, patients they just didn't like the sound perception when they didn't have the external processor on, mostly because of the mic. They, there are new uh, technologies that are being utilized, and Medel uh, announced in October of 2020 the first surgeries with their totally implantable cochlear implant. You know, I, I think if we're going to get uh, to totally implantable cochlear implants, we really need to solve the uh, pickup mic. And uh, Envoy is uh, preparing uh, to do this with cochlear implants. Some of you might be um, familiar with this device as a implantable hearing aid where the pickup mic is a piezoelectric piece that is glued to uh, the uh, uh, incus. And then that picks, that's a natural pickup mic uh, for the cochlear implant. Interesting in this too, is that the uh, processor is placed about where a pacemaker is placed. And uh, their argument for this is that that allows the battery to be replaced, much like a, uh, a pacemaker could be replaced. It does require us as uh, otologic surgeons to take a trocar and pass it all the way through the neck down to uh, uh, that position in the chest. And uh, uh, perhaps they will change that and put it up uh, in the areas that we feel more comfortable operating, uh, still to be determined. Uh, but a, a pretty cool concept where you don't have to have that external mic. You can use uh, the tympanic membrane and a secular chain as that uh, pickup mic to provide input to the uh, cochlear implant. Some of you are familiar with the work that uh, uh, I did at Vanderbilt where we did minimally invasive uh, cochlear implants with the concept being that if you know where you're going, you really don't need to drill the, uh, the mastoid. And this is uh, basic image guided surgery. Uh, this is what neurosurgeons do all the time for things like deep brain stimulators. So it, it requires that you register a plan to an inter intraoperative anatomy uh, by putting bone implanted markers in. Uh, that intraoperative CT scanner that you saw is really uh, crucial in making this happen. And then we uh, make a microstereotactic frame that's customized for the surgeon. And once you mount this onto the bone implanted markers, it provides a single pass of a surgical drill through the facial recess and targeting the optimal trajectory for uh, a uh, extended round window uh, cochleostomy. Uh, we're not the only group that's doing this. The group at the University of Bern in Switzerland is doing this as well. Uh, they uh, take a robotic approach to it. So instead of making a customized microstereotactic frame, they have a multi-articulated arm robot that uh, links uh, via image guidance to the patient. Uh, they've done a number of uh, patients and they've actually expanded uh, to a uh, different uh, center. Uh, so there's a couple centers in the EU which are doing this. Um, here's the electrode array going down an insertion tool that is placed into that single pass. And then you'll see a final CT scan which shows the uh, electrode array uh, Coiled within the cochlea, and then you know the most unique mastoidectomy you've ever seen for a uh, for a cochlear implant. 
Um, Medel is an investor in the Hero robot from the University of Bern, Switzerland's um, device, and I think they will continue to uh, explore that. Uh, this certainly got us into the concept of using image guidance and imaging to uh, insert uh, cochlear implant electrodes, which I think is where the, the real value of this is. This is a recently approved FDA robot uh, that came out of the University of Iowa. This is uh, uh, Marlon Hansen's <clears throat> work, Iota Motion. And the concept is that you attach this device on the top right on into the skull using those bone implanted um, mar uh, screws. And then the thing that looks like a nasal speculum goes down through the uh, facial recess and it's essentially two roller wheels that guide and slowly insert a cochlear implant electrode array. So here is the device anchored to the skull and then the surgeon aligns this with the flexible neck between what's screwed into the skull and the roller insertion mechanism. And uh, quite a bit of their preliminary work, which was done on uh, temporal bones, showed decreased forces of insertion, slower controlled insertions using this device. Uh, this is uh, uh, has been uh, commercialized and uh, uh, the company is actively seeking to place this in operating rooms and uh, and have it utilized right now for straight electrode arrays, but hopefully in the near future for pre-curved electrode arrays. And then this interesting device uh, is the uh, cochlear implant that has come out of China. And uh, this looks a heck of a lot like uh, a cochlear device, uh, but it's not, it's a Neurotron device. Uh, it's founded in 2006. Uh, the uh, the entry of this into the U.S. market may be uh, motivated by cost constraints. Uh, this paper uh, uh, estimated that it would be under $5,000 price point, which is a dramatic shift compared to uh, to the current cost of cochlear implants, which for many large medical centers exceed $20,000, sometimes to $25,000. They have the CE mark uh, approval. Uh, they are coming to the United States. Uh, it's only a matter of time. And uh, it will be interesting to see how this disrupts the field. Uh, you know, are you willing to put this in, device in? Maybe it's not uh, the slickest. Maybe it's uh, the outcomes are not quite as good. But if they're in the ballpark and it's dramatically cheaper, I think it's something that uh, people are going to have to be open to, especially with the increasing cost of healthcare. When I look at the history of cochlear implants, I often think back to the fact that it really was only about 50, 60 years ago that this was how otologic disease was handled. This was a, a, a chisel and a hammer to open up a mastoid and uh, relieve that abscess. And we got to the point now that, you know, the high speed surgical drill, that's the standard. So, you know, what is going to be the next advance from cochlear implants? We're kind of at that point where, you know, we're at about that 50 year mark of being in the industry. And what is the next big step forward in terms of technology and how can we increase those word scores from what's a, a relatively paltry 60 to 65 percent to something that's more uh akin to restoring natural hearing. How can we get these word scores consistently into the 80s and or even 90s, which I think really would be uh, a game changer. And oftentimes when, when you think about these things, it's not the ideas that are out there right now, right? It's, it's the ideas that uh, some crazy otologist or neurotologist or resident or medical student is having and just, you know, tossing these ideas out. Uh, and I often tell, uh, uh, medical students and residents say, look, you know, if you're within the field, you're almost constrained by what everybody thinks is the solution. Uh, but the solution probably comes from outside the field. And a, a really good way to try and articulate that problem is to find a family member who's not in medicine, who's not uh, an ear surgeon, and explain why your idea is going to work and see if they get it. And if they get it, then, you know, I think there's maybe a chance that it, it could be adopted. 
So with that, I'll be uh, happy to open it up for uh, any questions and I uh, appreciate your attention. Uh, thanks so much, Dr. Labadee. Uh, that was a great talk. Um, I can start with a question of my own and then I'm sure others will jump in. But uh, one thing that, that you highlighted was that the pre-coiled electrodes probably perform better in the majority of cases, but that the translocation probability is high, which maybe leads to equivalence in some studies between the straight and the pre-coiled electrodes when you take it as a group. I'm wondering in what you think in terms of when centers aren't using maybe intraoperative CT scanning, how, how, how do you suggest like the majority of academic centers or some of the other act, some other means to um, increase the likelihood of detecting that uh, typical typical uh, translocation event in a way that it can be corrected prior to leaving the operating room? Sure, yeah, I, I think the spread of excitation data is quite good right now. And the way the spread of excitation works is that you stimulate an electrode and then you record the response on all the other electrodes. So you should essentially have a single peak. So the electrodes that are closest to that electrode uh, should have the highest electrical charge. And then as you move further away, it should diminish. And if you have a fold over, what you see is a double peak where the electrodes that are in close proximity because they are folded over have the essentially the same charge they are receiving from that stimulating electrode. And that's uh, available on uh, the cochlear intraoperative software. Uh, I am not sure if it's available on the advanced bionic software. I see uh, Meredith is on the call and she may uh, be able to correct me on that. Uh, another uh, thing that everybody essentially can do is fluoroscopy. Uh, fluoroscopy, if you line it up correctly, uh, can give you a pretty good view. Tom Rowland at NYU is a huge advocate for using that uh, in patients. Uh, there's always the question of radiation exposure, fluoroscopy, or intraoperative CT scanning. Uh, the newer intraoperative CT scanning, which is cone beam CT scanning, uh, has actually less radiation exposure than uh, two to three shots of fluoro. Uh, and intraoperative CT scanning, while it probably will not be driven by otolaryngologists, I do think will become part of our operating rooms, just like fluoroscopy is part of that. So we're, we're starting to see it uh, in spine rooms. We're starting to see it in neurosurgical rooms. And uh, I think as that becomes more and more prevalent, that we will jump on board and utilize it for these cases. Uh, when I uh, uh, got the intraoperative CT scanner down here at MUSC, uh, it's amazing how many other specialties are interested in using it. Uh, facial trauma wants to use it. Ophthalmology wants to use it. Ortho hand wants to use it. So, you know, it has utility and, and I think, you know, buying it just for cochlear implants, while you can justify that from an economic standpoint, you, you have to do hundreds of these uh, a year before it's kind of a break even, but getting other service lines involved uh, spreads that cost over those, uh, those service lines as well. Thank you. Other questions, comments, concerns? Dr. Labadee, in terms of developing some of these new novel electrodes that you discussed, particularly a distal chip camera, what did you find were the biggest challenges in actually executing that? Was it an engineering challenge? Was it a funding challenge? Was it um, getting commercial companies to buy in? Yeah, a great question. Uh, I, I don't have hard data for you, but uh, my perception is that when you have a medical device company and you have a stable product, that they want you to use that stable product. Every little design change has to go back through the FDA and opens them up to uh, critique and the possibility that they will not be able to proceed ahead. 
And if it's only going to be an incremental market share, the cost for going through that is uh, not worth it. Uh, in terms of an engineering standpoint, these things are very accomplishable. Uh, in terms of getting them through the FDA, the FDA kind of swings from one extreme to the other. I think right now the FDA is very uh, reasonable and uh, wants to work with device companies to uh, be able to get new products out there. Uh, but changing the, like, say you're, you know, cochlear implant company A and you have two manufacturing facilities, you're going to have to retool all of your machines. You're going to have to, uh, you know, have a different quality assessment program. Uh, you're going to have to have a product launch. So then you have to show, okay, how is that going to shift the market share? And uh, so I think that's the biggest challenge right now. All right, well, um, if anyone has any questions, please feel free to interrupt me. But otherwise, um, I think we're, we're getting close to the hour. And I'd like to thank you, Dr. Levity, so much for that talk. And um, the lecture was recorded, so I will um, edit it and get it available to everyone if they want to share with uh, fellows and attendees who couldn't be here today. So thank you so much, Dr. Levity, for your time. Thanks, Josh. Really appreciate you putting this together. <laughs>